Okay. Nice to see all of you again. Good morning and good evening, uh, everybody in ICC. I am Dr. P.Y. Cho. Today, I am the uh, moderator before this webinar with my partner, co-moderator, Dr. Junior Tu. Today, we are so happy to invite Dr. Jordan Stamberger. Jordan Stamberger is a pediatric plastic cranial maxillofacial and the orthognathic surgeon within the divisions of pediatric plastic and the reconstructive surgery and the serve as surgical director of the cranial facial program at Nicholas Children's Hospital. Dr. Stanberg earned his medical degree and a doctorate in neuroscience through the medical scientist training program at John Hopkins University School of Medicine in Baltimore, Maryland. Dr. Stanberger then completed an integrated residency program in plastic surgery at Northwestern University McGough Medical Center in Chicago. Following this, he pursued a fellowship in pediatric craniofacial surgery at the Children's Health Care of Atlanta. His clinical interests include clip, lip, and the palate, congenital facial skeletal growth disorders and the syndromes, cranial stenosis, ear anomalies, jaw deformities requiring corrective surgery, ear anomalies, and the pediatric skin and soft tissue lesions. Dr. Stanberger, Stanberg is certified by the American Board of Plastic Surgery. Academically, his work has published in numerous peer-reviewed journals. He also has written chapters for medical textbooks presented at both national and international medical conferences and has served as a reviewer for various plastic surgery-related journals. He is frequently called upon by the media to provide expert commentary on topics related to pediatric plasticity and the cranial facial surgery. Dr. Stenberg has served as a mentor to students and the resident, and that has also held the role of cranial facial surgery fellowship co-director. Today, we are so happy to have this very exactly interesting topic by Dr. Jordan Stenberger. The topic is infant mandibular distraction osteogenesis for pure robin sequence, a current appraisal. We also invite three uh, panelists. The first one is Dr. Nisha from India. And the second one is Dr. Lan from Vietnam. And the third one is our faculty member, Professor Ting Chen Lu from Chang'an. So, we can wait uh, for Professor Jordan Stenberg's presentation. So Jordan, please. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm gonna share. Yes, please. Okay. Okay, is it coming up okay? Yes. Excellent. Thanks very much for, for the opportunity. This is a wonderful webinar series. And as my friends uh, know, I have been joining along, I think since the beginning of the COVID period and it's been uh, very informative. So I'm, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to present. Um, I work in Miami, Florida, which as some of you know, has a long history in craniofacial surgery, going back to Ralph Millard and then my uh, current uh, recently retired partner, Dr. Tony Wolf. I'm gonna talk this morning about infant mandibular distraction. And I know this is something that is uh, handled and treated quite differently uh, from one country to the next. Uh, and as we were briefly talking this morning, there was quite a bit of discussion at last year's International Cleft Congress in Scotland about this. So I hope to give a review this morning and then show you a little bit about what our preferred techniques are and then save a little time at the end for some questions. I don't have any disclosures for this work. Uh, 
I will be talking about a distraction device from K. Les Martin, but I don't have any financial arrangements with them. So I'm going to begin this morning with some background on Pierre Robin's sequence and what it is. We'll talk about the indications for surgical treatment. I'm going to review some surgical treatment methods and then talk about some outcomes of distraction as well as some complications. And then we'll finish up with some questions that I think are unanswered questions in this field and possible topics for future research. There were very early observations of infants with small jaws or micrognathia going back to the 1800s. And the uh, textbook uh, that Pierre Robin wrote from France in 1920, uh, 1923 uh, has gotten a lot of uh, attention. And uh, as many of you know, the uh, uh, Pierre Robin was a French stomatologist and he described a triad of retronathia glossoptosis or a tongue that falls back into the airway and then upper airway obstruction. The original description, and you see some diagrams from that uh, book in the lower left corner, uh, did not include a cleft palate. However, many patients do have a cleft palate, uh, about 85% or so. But the original triad was retrodnathia, glossoptosis, and upper airway obstruction. And so uh, just a short video clip, if a infant has these features, uh, you may see some respiratory distress in the form of retractions, sternal retractions, a small jaw, and then other supports, as in this infant where you see a nasal cannula, high flow cannula, as well as a feeding tube. So you can see those movements there. Um, the incidence of Pierre Robin sequence is about one in 8,000 to one in 14,000 live births. And uh, therefore it's not a very uh, uncommon condition. We do see it uh, quite often. Now, as I mentioned before, it does not formally include a cleft palate, but about 85% of patients will have a cleft that tends to be wide and U-shaped. And you can see from this photograph that's taken from the time of palatoplasty, that sometimes the palate repair will be delayed uh, for one reason or another relating to the patient's a medical condition. And you can see the teeth here. So this is an older child and quite a wide uh, vo to cleft palate. During development, around eight weeks or so of embryology, the tongue descends in the oral cavity and that then allows the palatal shelves to fuse together in the midline. And if that process is interrupted because let's say the jaw is too small and the tongue does not have room to descend in the oral cavity, you can have this series of events. And that's why we now call it an embryologic sequence, Pierre Robin sequence, rather than the previous name of Pierre Robin syndrome. There are many associated syndromes with Pierre Robin sequence. These are a few of the more common ones for example, Stickler syndrome or 22Q deletion syndrome. Uh, but there are some 400 or more uh, syndromes for which there has been some associated micrognathia or retrognathia. So whenever we have an infant with Pierre Robin sequence, we want to be thinking about genetic testing because there are frequently these associations. So again, how do we make the diagnosis in an infant? We are looking for these, these three findings. And there's been a lot of discussion about how to uh, identify and how to formalize the criteria for Pierre Robin. And this has been a topic for several international meetings, the first of which was organized by Korsten Brueggem in the Netherlands uh, in 2014. And now there have been two more international Pierre Robin consensus meetings. The last one uh, just occurred this year because it got delayed from COVID. Uh, but diagnosis is one of the important things that is a focus of this meeting. And uh, again, we're going to look for these three features, retronathia, glossoptosis, and upper airway obstruction. Now, how do you characterize clinically a small jaw? Well, there have been a few descriptions here. Probably the simplest way is to try to have an infant more upright and then to close the mouth so that you can measure the distance between the upper and the lower gums or the alveolar ridges. 
and you take a tongue depressor and um, make a mark uh, where that discrepancy is. That's probably the simplest way, but it can be uh, very distorted if the infant is moving or lying on the back rather than in an upright position. So patients really should be held upright. The jaw index is a similar concept that has been described uh, by a few authors. And this article came out after the consensus conference in the Netherlands. And you take a measurement from ear to ear across the upper lip and a similar measurement uh, across the, the pogonion. And you can come up with a ratio that is called the jaw index. So this is also used. Now for a glossoptosis, that tends to be something that we evaluate with uh, bedside laryngoscopy. So we will have our ENT colleagues take a look. And if we see this sign where the jaw is further back and the tongue is sitting sometimes up into the cleft palate, uh, but, but positioned further back such that it's blocking the airway, that's a sign of glossoptosis. And then finally, upper airway obstruction, which in this case really is tongue-based airway obstruction. Uh, and uh, uh, again, a lot of this assessment will initially come from a bedside laryngoscopy. And once we have established that it appears that the tongue is the issue, that's really what we want to establish because there can be many sources for obstruction, including lower airway problems like laryngomalacia or tracheomalacia. And we're trying to distinguish tongue-based obstruction from those other entities. Obstructive sleep apnea is the term that we give to uh, a tongue-based uh, airway obstruction uh, more formally, and as you know, there can be a lot of medical consequences to this. Pulmonary hypertension, right heart strain, feeding problems, failure to thrive, and behavioral disturbances, as well as even mortality. So uh, obstructive sleep apnea is an important thing uh, to be aware of in uh, young patients. And the way that we can judge the severity of obstruction is with a polysomnogram. Now, this is uh, a picture of a, a patient with a sleep study. And again, not all hospitals will have that uh, uh, technology available, uh, but it involves taking recordings, both from an EEG, uh, uh, oxygenation and carbon dioxide levels to get an idea of gas exchange, and then other movements of the chest. And all of these parameters are tracked and put together into a report. Now, when the uh, polysomnogram shows that there are drops in peak flow by greater than 90% from baseline, that's called an apnea. If it's uh, to a lesser degree uh, and it's a, a, a smaller drop in the peak flow, uh, then it's what we call a hypopnea. And the number of apneas and hypopneas are counted up during a period of sleep and used to come up with an index. Uh, what we call the apnea hypopnea index. And it's also uh, done in such a way as to distinguish between obstructive apneas that are associated with a respiratory effort versus those that are central with no effort. And again, we're looking for the number of obstructive apnea events. So we get an index, an AHI, or an apnea hypopnea index. And if it is between one and five, it's considered mild. If it's five to 10, it's moderate. And if it's over 10, then it's a severe uh, uh, apnea hypopnea index or, or obstructive sleep apnea. So we get a report back that looks like this. Here's a summary. RDI, or very similar to AHI, overall, let's say 85, which is quite severe. The obstructive apnea index, in this case, 25 per hour. Hypopnea is 56. So in this case, there's a lot of smaller pauses rather than full apneas but you calculate it all up at the end and the obstructive apnea hypopnea index is 84 per hour. So this infant would have a very severe uh, finding. And then on the oxygenation side, it tells us, okay, now there were 458 episodes of desaturation and the oxygen level got as low as 66%. So this would again be a very significant case. And then ventilation for CO2, in this case, 22.9% of the sleep time was spent with a CO2 above 50. So we would look at this analysis for this patient and, and this matches up to that photo that I had shown. Uh, this would be a very severe case. 
Now, an article was published a couple of years ago, and a few have been uh, similarly published, that we must be careful because in the neonatal period before 28 days of life, there's actually a finding that many infants who, who ha have normal uh, sleep parameters and, and have no other medical conditions, but were, were given sleep studies for other reasons, can have an abnormal AHI. So this study was done from uh, Riley Children's Hospital in, in Indiana in the United States, and they found that in a normal sample of, of NICU babies without uh, Pierre Robin sequence, that they had an average AHI of 14.9, which again would map to a severe case. So, you know, it's not just the AHI that we have to look at. We have to put all the pieces together because especially in the neonatal period, there can be a number of factors that give you uh, not so much apneas, but hypopneas. So uh, we're putting all of the pieces together to evaluate the test, not just one number. And again, this same point was made in a paper last year about normal sleep parameters and neonates. So we look at, uh, at the whole picture. Uh, Mark Urata's group uh, in uh, California has also described the use of single capillary blood gas measurements. And a PCO2 value from the capillary blood gas of 50 or above, 49.5 or above, uh, had a pretty good sensitivity and specificity for identifying those patients that would later go on to need further interventions like distraction surgery. So if you don't have access to polysom polysomnography, capillary blood gas measurements, which are easy to obtain, can be a good way to evaluate as well. And if you find that values are above the level of 50, uh, it can be an ominous sign that, that further intervention is needed. Um, and again, just correlating with some other parameters uh, in this case. So that's a little bit of background uh, on this uh, condition. And now let's talk a little bit about indications for surgical treatment. So once we have identified uh, these parameters, then um, you know what is the indication to do anything uh, and this is where we get into some controversy. So again, let's say that we have seen this infant identified tongue-based airway obstruction. All of you are familiar with this recommendation first that uh, positioning or conservative measures be tried. And this has been done for a long time where a suggestion will be made to have the infant lying either on the side or in prone position. There are also other ways to try to get around the oxygenation and ventilation issues, such as the use of nasal cannula, nasal trumpet, uh, or a nasal CPAP devices. And these have been used in different centers to different degrees. <laughs> Certainly the prone positioning is one of the things that is most commonly recommended uh, as a first maneuver. And a couple of groups have looked at this. This is, uh, again, on the top part uh, from Urata's group in California, evaluating just how effective prone sleep is. And then there was another group from France. And the findings are that there seems to be some reduction uh, in the degree of, uh, or in the number of events, but they really didn't have statistical significance. And there's concern because, as you all know, uh, there has been a campaign for several decades to make sure that infants don't sleep in the prone position because of a 15-fold higher risk of sudden infant death syndrome. And so even though in the hospital and in a monitored setting, we can put infants on their, uh, on their stomachs and sleep in the prone position, uh, we're not so comfortable making a recommendation that parents take a baby home and do prone sleeping. Uh, home monitors, for example, are not as uh, reliable as what we have in the hospital. So there's controversy about this and just the general effectiveness of repositioning or prone sleeping. Also, any of the conservative measures, whether it's prone sleeping or nasal trumpet, rely on the concept of catch-up growth. That means that we're waiting for some period of time before the infants uh, grow with the idea that the mandible may uh, come forward some and the problem is better as they get older. 
but it is questionable whether or not this occurs in all cases. And so this uh, review article from Gosain a few years back said, while the concept is often quoted, it's really a minority of objective studies that suggest that catch-up growth truly occurs, uh, and particularly in those cases where there are syndromes. It's really an unknown. Um, the other thing is that if infants are managed conservatively, uh, and they now get to the age where they're requiring cleft palate repair, there can be a lot of trouble with the cleft palate repair surgery where there's respiratory distress afterwards. So this was a group from Rotterdam, and they showed that delayed, uh, excuse me, despite delayed closure in the children with Pierre Robin sequence, about 30% uh, developed distress after palatoplasty if they had been managed conservatively for the Pierre Robin. So uh, these are all things that we take into account. Now, our algorithm uh, at our hospital looks something like this. And initially, I know it's a bit uh, confusing, but I will go through uh, as we go further along here. And that is that we first, again, identify the, the, the findings from the uh, you know, diagnosis for Pierre Robin sequence. We're looking for the retronathia, glossoptosis, airway obstruction, and this is going to involve clinical bedside assessment as well as laryngoscopy. Now, if we have identified Pierre Robin sequence on the right side, you'll see that we may first try temporizing or conservative measures. And if the infant is still having persistent desaturations, we will try to get an idea of the severity of the obstruction by doing a sleep study or polysomnography. Uh, and again, sometimes additionally capillary blood gas measurements. And if we find moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea with gas exchange abnormalities, I will then uh, commonly get a CT scan to evaluate the anatomy of the jaw because I wanna know if a distraction is going to be possible. Now, some infants may have a very, very abnormal jaw structurally and it may be difficult to perform a distraction. So, We'll get a CT scan to evaluate the anatomy. And at that point, schedule for a laryngoscopy in the operating room, followed by distraction if they seem to meet all the criteria. In some cases, if an infant is not a candidate for a distraction because the, uh, of a significant syndrome or dysmorphology of the jaw, a tracheostomy may be required. And Another, another thing that may push us in the direction of doing a distraction would be that even if the breathing problems were somewhat more mild, but there's really persistent feeding issues, that is, they may be okay without significant desaturations on a daily basis, but every time they try to orally feed, there's enough obstruction that it creates problems. That may be another thing to push us towards considering surgery. Some some percentage of these patients may still require gastrostomy, and I'll mention that a bit later, but this is the overall algorithm that we follow. So, okay, we've talked about how to make the diagnosis, what are some of the indications for uh, management, including surgery, and now what are the surgical methods? So, there is a, uh, again, a historical precedent for these infants to have a tracheostomy. And nowadays, as I'll show you, the, the methods that we do have uh, for intervention are successful enough to avoid this in over 90% of cases, but it's still always a possibility. Tongue lip adhesion, which is a historical operation, uh, not performed as much anymore, but is a possible way to treat this. Something called a subperiosteal floor of mouth release. Uh, again, that one uh, has fallen out of favor. And then MDO or mandibular distraction, which really goes back to uh, McCarthy's uh, description of distraction in the early 1990s. And it wasn't long after the initial descriptions in older children, uh, for example, with hemifacial microsomia, it wasn't long before this was used in infants uh, in 1998. And now, of course, there have been many reports. So again, we're going to take out this subperiosteal floor of mouth release because that's really not uh, done commonly. So trach, uh, as I mentioned, it is a bypass. It really does not correct any obstruction. It just is used to try to bypass the obstruction and rely uh, 
on some catch-up growth over time such that the tracheostomy can eventually be decannulated. But as you know, there can be many adverse events with the tracheostomy, including mucus plugging, uh, tracheal stenosis, and even death uh, if the tracheostomy uh, is occluded or falls out. So it's, it's not without consequence, and it requires a lot of rigorous maintenance. The tongue lip adhesion, uh, again, is an older operation. The principle is that the tongue is sutured to the lower inner part of, of the lower lip or the floor of mouth for a temporary period of time. And during that period of time, again, it's assumed that the infant will grow and have some catch-up growth of the mandible such that the procedure can be reversed before uh, he or she starts speaking and before it becomes a problem with feeding. And there are various different ways to do a tongue lip adhesion. There have been many uh, techniques described. The biggest complication with a tongue lip, lip adhesion is dehiscence uh, because uh, it relies on uh, this suture traction and initial healing. And during that uh, first period, there can be movements of the tongue and suture pull through. And then I think, uh, again, the method that has now in many centers become uh, a first line method, which is mandibular distraction. And it's really, again, the only surgical method that directly addresses the small jaw. Uh, a survey was done by uh, some of my colleagues in Washington, DC a few years back and found through the ACPA, as well as the International Craniofacial Society, that this is now in three quarters of centers is now the first line preferred method of surgical treatment. Now, some places will do distraction surgery with an internal device, which is what I'm going to show you today. Uh, others will do it with an external device that has pins that go through the skin into the mandible. And there are, even with internal devices, there are different ways to, uh, to structure it, whether the turning pins come out uh, more distally by the chin region or whether the turning pins come out behind the ear. I like to do it in this way here where the turning pins are exiting behind the ear uh, and those spots heal up quite well without any real visible scar uh, later in time. I use a internal, uh, it's called a distal end driven device from KLS Martin uh, that is available both in 20 millimeters and 30 millimeters. And for some patients, we need the longer one because we have to go a, lar a longer distance to make up for the discrepancy. Uh, and so that uh, for me is an individual decision based on the anatomy. I'm gonna play this video just demonstrating our technique here. Infant mandibular distraction osteogenesis with a 30 millimeter device. A submandibular incision is made half to one finger breadth inferior to the mandibular angle region. The section continues subcutaneously until the platysma muscle has been identified. The platysma muscle is then undermined with a clamp and the fiber is divided with electrocautery. Dissection continues subplatysmally with blunt spreads paralleling inferior border of the mandible. The safety of the dissection is aided with the use of a nerve stimulator to protect the marginal mandibular branch and the facial nerve. The pterygomastoteric sling is then identified and divided and subperiosteal sections performed to expose the mandibular angle, ramus, and proximal body regions. Once this has been achieved, the distractor is assembled in the back table. The device is brought over the field and aligned on the inferior border of the mandible in the desired vector, which is horizontal. A subcutaneous tunnel is then established for exit of the turning arm of the distractor. A 14 French suction catheter is cut and delivered through this tunnel into the incision. And this is then used to grasp the turning arm of the distractor to pull it back through the posterior exit site. The alignment of the device on the mandible is then double checked and it is retracted out of the way in preparation for the osteotomy. 
The osteotomy is completed using the piezoelectric saw in an inverted L fashion, allowing enough room for device foot plate fixation, but remaining proximal to the tooth butts. The osteotomies are made completely for the superior and inferior portions of the mandible, and then an anterior corticotomy is made for the mid portion. The device is then fixed onto the mandible. The, dev the device is activated using the turning arm, and the back wall osteotomy is now completed with the use of a two millimeter osteotome. At this time, uh, activation is performed and complete separation of the bony uh, portions is ensured, taking care to protect the neurovascular bundle. A caliper is then used to uh, return the device to a starting position of two to four millimeters of on-table distraction. On-table distraction allows for safe immediate extubation at the end of surgery. In okay, so um, I mentioned at the end of that video that our protocol allows for two to four millimeters of opening right immediately after surgery. And the reason that I prefer to do this is because I think even just that little bit of opening of the device allows us in many cases to be able to extubate the infant immediately right after the procedure. Many centers have a protocol where these infants will be kept on the ventilator with the endotracheal tube in place for even the whole length of the distractor turning period or at least one week. Uh, and our protocol is such that if the patient does not have an endotracheal tube coming into surgery, that is, they, if they did not require preoperative intubation, then we prefer that they be extubated right at the end. It does not interfere with consolidation, for example, to have the distractor slightly open at the very beginning. Um, when we do uh, extubate infants, we do have some safety measures, including a tongue suture or a nasal trumpet to help uh, in that initial period. Uh, we will wean supplemental oxygen as tolerated and continue distractor turning at a rate of two millimeters a day. So one millimeter in the morning and one millimeter in the evening. And then there's always a question of how far do you go? And I like to go till about five millimeters of class three overcorrection at the alveolar ridges or maximal opening of the device. Now, some groups will simply turn every infant to the maximum. So if they use a 30 millimeter device, it's always 30 millimeters. But I try to be a little bit cautious of going too much. And it's not because we're going to make the patient class three for the rest of his life or her life, but it's because if we, if we do go too far, sometimes you really do have trouble with the closure of the lips and the competence during feeding. So I have found it uh, to be uh, anecdotally uh, desirable just to maybe go about five millimeters over correction, um, but that has to be judged in, on a case by case basis. I do get a plain film x-ray after we remove the bedside, uh, by bedside, the turning pins, just to confirm before we um, enter the consolidation period. And then we will get a speech language pathology consult to start working on oral feeding and weaning of the, of the NG tube. Uh, and then we will get a follow-up sleep study, which I prefer to get several months later, not in the hospital, but as an outpatient prior to cleft palate repair. Um, we secure the endotracheal tube during surgery like this. Uh, it's an oral tube. It's, um, it is fixed at the upper alveolar ridge, and it's flipped up so that it's also secured at the hairline. It's very similar to what we would do for orthognathic surgery to take it out of the way. But I've mentioned this because with these small tubes and a lot of manipulation in an infant, it's very, very easy to have an unplanned extubation in the middle of surgery. So the tube has to be uh, secured well, and we have to think about the movements turning from side to side so that there's not an emergency code event in the middle of the procedure. Small endotracheal tubes are prone to movement, and this is another reason why I really prefer to try to extubate them at the end. You can see in this radiograph, the end of that endotracheal tube is right at the carina, and some cases, again, if the infant is kept intubated for many days after that this uh, tube at the carina will trigger a, a vagal response and sometimes even a bradycardic arrest. And so uh, it, it, there, are, there can be a lot of uh, dangers with these small endotracheal tubes staying for long periods. And so I really think that 
uh, it is uh, beneficial to try and remove them as soon as it is safe. Um, here again, a close-up view of that tube right at the carina. Um, the group from CHOP in Philadelphia has published that there is a significantly increased risk of complications and failure if the extubation is performed before day number five. But what I would say is that it really depends on your protocol because, for example, in their article, they were distracting and turning at a different rate than what we are doing. Uh, and uh, they have a longer latency period. So for example, where we'll start turning the next day, uh, some centers are waiting two and three days before they even begin to turn. So um, you know, all of these variables can affect the, uh, the extubation protocol. So here's a, a clinical example from that infant I showed before with the preoperative obstructive AHI of 92, uh, who uh, had a postoperative AHI of zero uh, when uh, she was retested. Uh, and this is prior to the cleft palate repair. And again, you can see that we are often getting an overcorrected appearance with a jaw that's quite prominent at first. But this is not the case. If you look several years later, for example, they will often uh, come back into a more uh, reasonable position without looking so exaggerated on the prognathism. Uh, I mentioned I get a plain film x-ray on the day that we are planning to remove the, the turning pins just to see and verify that the hardware is in good position and the the base of the tongue can be visualized on a lateral plain film x-ray as well as the airway stripe showing that the airway has been opened up. Uh, and again, it allows us in many cases to proceed with cleft palate repair at a fairly normal time of uh, 10 months or 11 months of age. We try not to get too many CT scans on these infants again, just because of exposure. Uh, and so post-op, I will tend to just have that plain film rather than getting another CT. This is another patient with a syndrome, uh, Pierre Robin associated with a very unusual genetic syndrome. And you can see that the post-operative AHI improved to 5.2, which is not fully normal, but, but improved. And um, we'll talk about that in a second because in some cases you can't completely normalize all the testing, but you can certainly make improvements. And again, uh, looking at the radiograph post-op, you can see where the mandible is with respect to the maxilla uh, and uh, overcorrected position and then palatoplasty later. So that's, um, uh, again, a little bit about the distraction methods. Uh, let me speak for a minute about outcomes and some complications, and then we're going to finish off with some uh, points about unanswered questions and future future studies. So if you look across the literature about mandibular distraction and you evaluate success in terms of avoiding a tracheostomy, all of the studies pretty much are showing that it's highly effective and the success rate of avoiding tracheostomy is usually somewhere in the 90, 95% range, uh, which is what these, these authors have shown. If you look at the, uh, the outcomes uh, as well, uh, in this article, which was from a, a group uh, at Indiana, similarly, just like it's effective with avoiding tracheostomy, it's also very effective in improving obstructive sleep apnea. And here only a small percentage of patients that had residual severe obstructive sleep apnea. As I mentioned, though, you may have a case where the infant is not severe anymore, but we get from a severe state to a mild state. So one question is, if I've improved the situation uh, so that there's now only a mild sleep apnea and AHI of 5.2, um, you know, is that considered as a, a success? What is the definition of success? If we have an infant that has to go home from the hospital still with a little bit of oxygen, is that a success? And so everybody has a little different opinion on what the endpoint is supposed to be. I think we can all agree that when we're talking about tracheostomy, avoiding a tracheostomy is certainly a fine goal. But once you start to get a little finer than that, there's a lot of disagreement. If you look at feeding outcomes, there's also a lot of success with distraction. 
Uh, several authors have looked at this as well. About 82% in this study at one year after distraction were feeding orally, 100% uh, orally. And um, this, we also know that distraction seems to be much more effective than the tongue lip adhesion, which a lot of uh, groups were doing in the past. And now, as I mentioned, many have switched over, both because of uh, the obstructive apnea and the breathing, as well as the feeding. So whether it's breathing or feeding, it seems that the distraction is a very effective operation and superior to the tongue lip adhesion. Uh, several groups uh, have looked at what is happening to the shape of the mandible with a distraction. Because in Pierre Robin sequence, the jaw is not quite normal in terms of its appearance. It tends to be a, uh, a wider, shorter ramus. The angle is a little bit different than controls. And when you distract, you tend to make a, a jaw that is much longer in terms of the mandibular body length, but the ramus is still shorter. So a few groups have looked at this and trying to evaluate what is the best uh, you know, morphology in terms of getting airway improvement, or can we use this to predict how the operation should be performed? A couple of the authors that have looked at this, uh, Derek Steinbacher, who I know has spoken recently in, the, in this webinar, and then a surgeon, Russell Reed from Chicago, and both of their groups have studied this quite a lot in terms of looking at the shape of the mandible after distraction. And it was very interesting between these two groups because one group liked to do the distraction with a straight horizontal vector, uh, Steinbacher, for example, and then Russell Reed's group liked to do it in an oblique 45 degree vector. And what they found is that really both were effective in, in helping the airway, but there were some differences in terms of the shape. So we really don't understand all of these different details and what is happening three-dimensionally to the airway, uh, you know, and how to take that information and correlate it with the success. It, it, I, the point from all of these slides is to say that even with all of this analysis, it's still really clinical decision-making, uh, trying to look at the infant with the symptoms and then afterward evaluating how those symptoms have improved. But we don't have all of the answers to make all the predictions yet. Um, a couple of years ago, I looked with my group at the laryngoscopy outcomes and the difficult airway label. As you know, patients uh, will uh, be graded by the anesthesiologist, whether they have grade one, two, three, or four airways. And we were curious to see what the uh, change was. And in fact, most patients uh, who have, say, grade three or four airways at the beginning will go to a grade one after distraction. Yeah, this was a three centers. We looked at this uh, a couple of years ago when I was still at Hopkins. And <clears throat> time point number one versus time point number two, most of the patients shift towards a grade one or grade two airway uh, after distraction. And <clears throat> again, the sleep studies show a lot of improvement from an average AHI of 38.6 to an AHI of 2.9. Very interestingly, you know, we found that uh, although uh, there was this improvement that you could see with the airway, a lot of patients still would carry on their medical chart this label of having a difficult airway. So we're now trying to be much more careful that if the airway is improved and there's a grade one view that we take this label off of the medical chart because otherwise it can stay on there for the rest of the patient's life, sort of like a penicillin allergy. You know, once you get the label, it's hard to take it off. But there is good reason uh, after a successful distraction, if you, if you have improvement in grade one airway, there's good reason to remove the difficult airway status. Now, what about complications? Uh, this is not a, a small surgery. And we say for the parents all the time, there's a lot of things that can be a problem with the mandibular distraction when the jaw is so small, including particularly having uh, a dental injury, tooth injury, or nerve-related injury. And this is just from a review article, but we looked at this about eight years ago now in a study where we asked patients in Atlanta to come back to see us at least five years or more after having had distraction during infancy. And what was the finding in terms of nerve testing and dental exam? 
And just around the time that our paper was published on the right side, there was a group from the Netherlands that published very similar a topic, I think maybe even in the same issue or next month. And um, what we found is that about half of the time, you can detect some injury later on the radiographs to the first permanent molar, because this tooth is, is just really a tooth bud at that time that you're doing the surgery. And it is right in the way of where you try to make the osteotomy. So the good news was that about 75% of the time, these injuries could be restored with basic dental care but you have to be aware of the possibility of creating uh, injuries to, to the first molar or second molar. Um, when we did vitality testing of the teeth, looking at the nerves for the inferior alveolar nerve, we only found that one of 40 half mouths or 2.5% had some loss of cold sensitivity. So this doesn't seem to be as much of an issue and it's not known whether if that nerve is stretched or injured, if it just regenerates, uh, or maybe injury is not as common. I see it very often, uh, and we work around it uh, when we're doing the procedure. We specifically try to do the front wall and then the back wall to, to avoid the nerve. Um, and the marginal mandibular, okay, facial nerve function is also important. We looked at this with this same population coming back after at least five years and grading them. And about 15% of operated sides will, in this case, had some evidence of weakness. And that, again, that's not insignificant. So um, you can detect this easily with photography and video, whether there's a little bit of depressor weakness, but because that marginal mandibular nerve is so small, uh, you know, and it can be right in the way of the dissection, uh, it's important to keep that in mind. Now, since this study was done years ago, I now, uh, in all cases, routinely use the uh, checkpoint nerve stimulator. And, and uh, we're trying to identify where that is so that as we approach down to the mandibular border, we are uh, avoiding that. But uh, even from stretch, you can have uh, this occur. Some authors have talked about doing virtual planning to avoid the inferior alveolar nerve or the tooth buds. And I have to say that um, even though a lot of these photographs look very nice in the literature, I don't do this. And the reason I don't use the virtual planning for this operation is because to me, the most important thing with the success of this surgery is that the device be stably anchored on the bone. You need to have good bone stock to put the device in screws. And that's something that I like to see in surgery. Because if you go with the computer to say, I'm going to put a screw here and I'm going to fix it here. When you get into the operating room, sometimes that area may not be uh, as reliable of a place to rest the device, or it may not sit flat, and the arm is not coming out by the ear like you want. So to me, it's limiting if you try to go exactly where, where the guides tell you. And some uh, centers have had difficulty when they're using the VSP that the, the device has not been stable and it lifts off of the bone during the turning process. And that's the last thing that you want is to have an unpredictable fracture or a mechanical problem in the middle of the procedure, and then the airway is not resolved. So number one most important thing with this operation is to fix the airway problem. If you have a dental or nerve-related issue, again, it is a possibility, but I think that uh, has to be one of the possible side effects that you consider. Um, as I mentioned, I tried to minimize CT scans. We looked at this. Uh, you know, there, there can be a significant lifetime risk if you get a lot of CTs over the course of infancy. And some of the, the groups that are doing virtual planning for the infants, they're getting two and three CT scans even before one year of age. So you have to think about all of that, and it's a lot of extra uh, radiation exposure. Okay, so I'm going to the last part, just a couple of things about the future, and then hopefully we have a little uh, time for some questions. Um, I mentioned before, how do you define success and how do you define failure with this procedure? Uh, and I think this needs a little bit more attention. Again, you know, we, we can all come to some agreement when we talk about trying to get an AHI below 20, avoiding a tracheostomy, avoiding mortality. But when we start getting more specific about eliminating all oxygen support or trying to correct the uh, 
uh, cephalometric discrepancies, which people talk about as well, then things change a little bit. So this is a topic that needs a little bit more attention. Um, how, again, is, uh, how are we supposed to be proceeding in terms of the mandibular morphology, uh, again, and the airway shape? These are all things that really are not known. If you look in the upper picture, you can see after distraction that the jaw becomes, uh, with this horizontal vector that they use at the Yale Center, that the jaw has a very long mandibular body, but the ramus is still short. So, so what are the consequences of that? And again, these are things that still are requiring study. I mentioned about the catch-up growth. This is really, uh, again, very controversial. Do babies with syndromes have catch-up growth to the same degree as an isolated Pierre Robin sequence? Um, you know, it, these things are really not, uh, not known. Um, in Scotland, in Edinburgh meeting last summer, uh, the group from Germany and Tubing in Germany presented their data on what they call the TPP. This is the Tubingen palatal plate, and it is an appliance that gets inserted with an extension that's specifically made to go down into the vallecula, and it's placed with endoscopic guidance. And they've had a lot of success for infants without any surgery to place these appliances and then months later have an improvement uh, with, with a very good degree of success, but it requires a lot of skill and then the ENT expertise to help uh, place the device with the extension, the spur extension endoscopically. Um, but not all centers, again, have that kind of expertise to make this device, and it relies on the same concept of having catch-up growth. So it can be very patient dependent as to whether uh, there are other factors that will allow the child and the mandible to grow during that period enough to avoid further treatment. And then also monitoring and ICU care. You know, in some countries, it may be acceptable that an infant stay in the hospital for several months with PROVN sequence for monitoring. In other cases, uh, the health system may not support that. And so distraction may be a better choice. Uh, as I mentioned, these are all topics for this Pierre Robin consensus meeting. Uh, the last one, again, I think was several months ago, and I don't know when the, uh, the fourth meeting will be, uh, but uh, there's a lot of uh, unanswered questions in this field. And so uh, I'm going to leave, leave everyone with that. Thank you very much for the time. If there's some questions, uh, I'd be happy to try to answer those. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Steinberg, for your um, fascinating lecture on this topic. Now, um, I'd like to move on to our panelists first. So I'd like to invite Dr. Morali Nisha. Would you like to comment first? Sure, thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Steinberg. That was an excellent presentation. And um, there was a lot that I actually learned from your uh, presentation, especially with regard to distracting two to four millimeter on table, which uh, facilitates early extubation. I think that's a very, uh, that's something different because most surgeons or most papers that I've read prefer to start the distraction after afterwards. So I think this is something that, uh, so I assume that after you, do the initial two to four millimeter, then from the post-operative day one, you continue the distraction by one millimeter every day? Yes, thanks. So uh, if we are opening the device immediately, then we will usually start turning the very next morning without any latency period at all. Right. And, you know, I know that for many that do distraction, whether it's mandibular distraction or cranial distraction, or maxillary distraction, that it's pretty standard that there's some latency period. And all I can tell you is that it still works. So you don't have to have a latency period. Um, and you know, I, I have not seen any cases where we've had a non-union or issues like this. So, you know, because of the 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 airway, you can make more rapid progress. Uh, by having it open a little bit and then starting the turning early. And especially if you did not extubate the patient, you know, then I think you can get maybe with just a few days of uh, intubation and before you consider uh, with the neonatology team taking the tube out 
because you're already that many more millimeters ahead. Whereas with the other protocols, you wouldn't be there until one to two weeks. Right, yeah, I mean, yeah, that makes sense, thank you. And um, have you had any experience using bioresorbable uh, distraction devices? I've read about them, but I'd like to know if you have any experience with that. I do, I do. Um, and not so much on my, my personal practice. Uh, I've been in practice eight years, um, but uh, when I was a fellow at, in Atlanta, about half the patients were done with resorbable devices and half the patients with the titanium. And that was a surgeon preference. And what I can tell you is that the, the resorbable system, and in the US, there was only one manufacturer that was making that. And, and it works. And you can get, I think, enough improvement to, uh, to, to get over the airway issues initially. But I feel there's a limit to how far you can go with the resorbable device, because at some point, the forces required to keep it on the bone, you know, are, are sort of uh, um, exceeded by, by the tensions and the pressures in the soft tissues. So you, you get to a stage where maybe you've gone 12, 14, and then if you, if you keep trying to go more, I, you get into high, higher risk of mechanical problems where the resorbable plates can lift out of the bone. It just doesn't have the same strength, I think. And so a lot of uh, places abandoned that or you know, just weren't using it anymore. So for a more limited length of distraction, um, a mild case, uh, it does have some advantages. You don't have to go back for a second operation. And I think that you know, when we're talking about the marginal mandibular nerve and scar tissue, you know, all of these things can be reduced risk if you have a resorbable system potentially. But uh, the titanium systems, I think, are more reliable for the internal. Hey, thank you so much, Dr. Steinberg. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nisha. And next, I'd like to invite Dr. Lan. Hello, um, I'm Dr. Lan from uh, Vietnam. National Children's Hospital, and uh, at um, our hospital, uh, we have uh, from 20 to 30 cases of uh, Robin sequence, uh, and I mean severe cases of uh, Robin sequence every year. Uh, so I have two questions for you. Uh, the first question is um, uh, how to decide the vector of uh, destruction and Um, the the vector that I prefer again is more of a horizontal vector, uh, and the foot plates of the internal device is sort of paralleling the the inferior border of the mandible. That's usually how I fix it. If you go more vertical or oblique, and some people do, again, I think you can get still some uh, improvement in the airway volume. Uh, but if you look at that, there's one article, again, comparing the two centers. And there weren't huge differences. But if you go forward, more horizontal, you, you do get a larger degree of airway opening. It doesn't always correlate with a better result. But you can get more volumetric airway improvement by going straight horizontal. Um, and again, all of the patients will come back a little bit over time. We're not doing this surgery to correct a uh, class two cephalometric profile, but because they all come back, when we looked at these patients more than five years later, the ones that have more of like a horizontal vector, because we had two surgeons in this study, one would do one way, another one would do another, but they do have a better profile also if you have more of a horizontal vector and you really overcorrect to that class three position. So again, we're not doing it for the, for the appearance, but I think that both the airway improvement and the appearance uh, is 
is a little better with a horizontal vector. So that's how I prefer to do it. And then the osteotomy, again, you, you want to just do it in such a way that you can fix the device on good, stable bone. And so for me, that, again, I make an inverted L, but it's not exactly the same place every patient. It just depends on how I can position it so that I can really fix it well, um, you know, in good, stable bone. Um, it's better not to be too far anterior because, again, then you're really going to have higher risk of getting into right into tooth buds and, and the, the area where the nerve is more obvious. So you have to balance all of those things. And then second part about the tongue lip first, um, yes, it, it is certainly an acceptable way to proceed. Uh, and, um, you know, in some patients, if you have improvement with tongue lip, uh, then maybe you didn't need the distraction. But it's getting back to that question again about the catch-up growth. So a syndromic yeah. patient, syndromic patient, maybe will not have that much growth of the mandible to get you improvement with the tongue lip. So it, you have to evaluate all of the medical factors as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, can I have one more question? Uh, we have some case, uh, um, some case of uh, hemifacial microsomia, uh, but uh, they have a problem with the upper airway. Uh, can you uh, do many mule distraction uh, one side uh, when they are in neonatal times or not? Yeah, thanks. So another very good question, and I. I would also invite my colleagues from Changgung to comment on this, but you know, I have really moved away from doing early distractions for hemifacial microsomia patients. I really don't like that anymore. Um, I don't think the results are long lasting, but the question is for airway. Um, I would have to say that in a lot of cases, if there's a is there hemifacial microsomia and there's very significant airway problem, many times we are trying to encourage the tracheostomy uh, and waiting until they're older because those are patients, uh, both hemifacial microsomia and Treacher Collins, where you're just not likely to be so successful with the distraction. And you, you can create a lot of problems uh, with, uh, you know, further ankylosis and scar tissue. You, some of you may remember we had the lecture by Richard Hopper uh, a couple of months ago on the Treacher Collins. And he made this point as well, you know, for the infancy, there's some conditions where I think it may be mo much more problematic to try to do a distraction as an infant. And you may really create a lot of problems for later. Yes, I understand. Thank you very much for the sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lan. And regarding this question, I'd like to invite Dr. Liu, who, who is also our next panelist, to give us some comments. <laughs> so, uh, actually, the for the hemifacial microsomia, that's I also have the same questions for you. <laughs> so, um, but you, I, I think you already answered to me, like to us, that it's not suitable for the mandibular distraction because we have uh, several. Uh, syndromic patient. So how about the nigger syndrome? Like nigger syndrome with a very small jaw with a, um, so do you, will you use the mandibular distraction? Yeah, so thanks. I, I think it's, that is very similar to the Treacher Collins again. So you may get a CT scan, evaluate the anatomy and you see that the jaw is small and it's further back. So the question of, can I make enough improvement in the airway to do a distraction now? Um, and those are cases where in the past, maybe we said, okay, we'll try it and see if we can get enough improvement. But I really today I, I had a different feeling about it from what uh, these others have shown us, which is that the success rates for, for anything other than mild cases, the success rates for a lot of those very complicated mandibular anatomies are just not great. And so they may still need a tracheostomy in the end. And I'm much more hesitant to do a distraction uh, for the obstructive sleep apnea in the infant, whether it's Nager or Treacher Collins, it's just really the same, same thing. And then sometimes you have to really see whether there's even room because if there is uh, such a small amount of bone stock and you're planning to use an internal device, you really may not have 
uh, very much bone uh, because things are so abnormal. Uh, hemifacial in particular, sometimes, you know, if it's the Prusansky 2B or 3, you, you may not have very much there. Mm -hmm. So uh, like if there's a patient uh, with a bilateral hemifacial microsomia, and uh, the patient also have a um, uh, like speech problem because they say there's a AOA problem. So would you do like, if the patient is only four year old, will you do the distraction for the patient? Uh, well, so I, I pretty much uh, moved away from doing any, any mixed dentition age distraction on hemifacial microsomia. I just don't do it anymore. Because, you know, like those were vertical vector distractions. And then we would have, try to have a period of orthodontics afterwards. And I, I, I am in favor of non-surgical treatments and functional appliances and things, but early distraction surgery, uh, the results just aren't good. I, in my opinion, I don't know. Okay, thank you. I, I, I'm curious to hear everyone's thoughts on that too. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I have another question is, um, um, so how do you choose the uh, the size of the distractor for the baby? Like in the video, you use like 30 millimeter lens. If it, it is a newborn baby, will you still use like 30 millimeter or use a smaller one? Okay, so good question. The the 20 and 30 millimeter distractors that I choose between, they're exactly the same size for the foot plates. Mm -hmm. So the part of the titanium part that goes on the bone is the same. The only difference is the length of the of the shaft. And, you know, if it's a it's a longer shaft. So if I know, for example, that a particular case is going to need many more millimeters to get out in front of the maxilla, you know, then I will put a 30 millimeter device. So I don't use 30 for all cases. Some I use 20 and some I use 30, but the size of the plates is the same in this case. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Liu. And next but not least, but uh, I'd like to invite Professor Lowe. Professor? Uh, yeah, Dr. Stanberg, and uh, very nice presentation. I actually learned from listening to your talk. Uh, I personally, I do not have much experience about the mandibular destruction. Uh, from your presentation, also my uh, my understanding is that there state there still uh, so much so many things that we still don't understand, and there are still a, a lot of an uh, unanswered question that we. We are waiting for uh, some group that have large, serious, and long-term experience uh, report so that we will, we can have a, a, a definite uh, answer for for that uh, for uh, for for this topic. And uh, I I do have one question for you that uh, in one of your uh, literature review you mentioned that there's a paper saying. Relapse is 64.8 percent. Am I right? And 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 this re relapse is is a, a a relapse of phenotype. It's not not surgical relapse. Is it right? Um. Yeah. So there was one review article where they were quoting that, and I I don't know. I'd have to go back to that to see um, what exactly they meant by it, but. You know, there is, again, different people will define that differently. So it doesn't mean that there is relapse in terms of having an airway problem, or does it mean that there's relapse in terms of having uh, a, you know, class two position again? I think that um, we see in all cases that the, that the overcorrected position will return and there will be some tendency to come back with the mandible position. But uh, it's unusual, I would say, clinically to have a successful distraction and then have the infant get into trouble again later on with uh, respiratory distress and desaturations. It may be that it's more common that you get 
where you, you never fully got enough improvement from the operation initially. And some people don't, they don't always know that because uh, again, maybe they're not doing all of the testing afterwards. I think it's important not only to just clinically evaluate, but you, you do want to see that gas exchange and, you know, follow-up sleep study O2 CO2, it, you know, is, is still, uh, is improved. Um, so uh, I have seen that also in some papers where they quote a high relapse rate, but I don't know also what that means in every case. It's a little bit unclear. Thank you. And also, uh, uh, you mentioned in your talk that uh, you do not uh, you do not like to do too much overcorrection. Uh, and in some cases that you presented, uh, you actually already destruct two twenty millimeter, right? To me, that's already a lot. And also, if you have a device that can allow you to do more destruction. You're not going to do that. You 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 will stop. Um, you know, at some point that that you feel happy. Am I right? Well, it's it, it it's a good question. So my my friend Dr. Yurata in in Los Angeles. So every baby thirty millimeters. That's the that's their protocol. <laughs> and I'm not saying it's wrong because again, you know, I think the studies show. And he just published a paper. I think maybe within the last two or three months. And what they say is that if you go more, it's better. That there, you know, that it helps the airway. The more yeah. you go, the more you go, the better you are. But what I'm saying is that may be true, but you have to think not just airway. There are some other things too. And when I when I talk to the feeding therapists, they will look at the patient and and evaluate when they go to take the bottle. If you go so far, you know, they can't even close the lips together. And so, you know, there is some balance. Uh, they will all come back a little bit, but I don't always go, you know, uh, to the full length of the device. I would say most time, if I have a 20 millimeter device, I will go to the end to 20 in many mm -hmm. cases, unless it's mild. But I use the 30 millimeter device, not always to 30. Sometimes it, you can create other problems. Uh, and, and a lot of those other problems mm -hmm have to do with feeding and oral feeding yeah, yeah because uh in my in some of my experience i feel that if i do destruction i will do as as much as possible mm -hmm. you know for example if i do the four three destruction if i do uh you know to the limit of my device i will do as much as possible because uh very soon you feel that uh you for example the relapse that we just talked about that could be uh, relapse with the phenotype, uh, you know, uh, so a, a crucial uh, problem relapse. So, but th this is maybe the the difference in philosophy in concept. That mm -hmm. uh, for for me, I would prefer to do uh, as much as overcorrection as as possible. I will tell you also, you know, there are parents that I talk to them and I explain, you know, we need to overcorrect, and they say, "Well, doctor, I don't want you to go anymore." Because I, I, like, I don't like the way he looks. He looks very, very strange. He's going to stay like this. I don't like the way the chin looks. I said, no, no, it's not going to stay like that. But sometimes they, the parents they get very concerned that the, you've made the child look very strange. Okay, so. Yeah, yeah. But be, because uh, overcorrection doesn't uh, last too many, too many years more. Correct. And very, very quick, you will see uh, that the baby, that the patient still had did uh, another bone surgery in, in the future. But anyway, thank you very much for your yeah. uh, presentation. Very, uh, very nice talk. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lo. And next, I guess we'll go to our Q&A session. So the first question is actually from our good friend Bernard. And the question is, what is the incidence of airway associated anomalies such as tracheomalacia or tracheostenosis? And how would this affect the outcomes of the MDO? Yes, thank you. Good question, good question. Uh, it is not uncommon to have some laryngomalacia, okay? I would say that on the bedside laryngoscopy that it's, it's not unusual to identify some. If it is a mild component of laryngomalacia, the studies have shown uh, 
that that also has the capacity to improve with a mandibular distraction. And Roberto Flores from New York uh, has published a couple of papers saying that laryngomalacia should not be a uh, exclusion criteria for considering distraction surgery, okay? But if we start to see that there is tracheomalacia and tracheal abnormalities, then for me, that's the concern. And that's why we're doing these tests with the laryngoscopy, bronchoscopy, because if there's lower airway subglottic problems, then it should be something that changes our opinion. And, and then you could do a distraction and it wouldn't help because you still have tracheal anomalies. So you do have to evaluate for lower airway problems and exclude them before you go on to doing a distraction. Okay. Um, thank you. And our next question is from Dr. Monica. And the question is, is there a recommended age where you do the MDO or would age not be a factor at all? Uh, another good, good question. Uh, you know, it really, it can be done at any time point. Um, I have had some kids that, you know, they were on other supports, like whether it's nasal trumpet or home oxygen or home CPAP. And now, you know, they're even just after a year of age, but we're making a decision to go ahead with this to try to eliminate those other supports. So it can be done at any time. It's actually, technically, I think it is a little bit easier to do in the neonatal period, even in the first month, than it is even three months, let's say, down the road, because the bone gets a little thicker. Uh, and again, you're trying to very carefully do the osteotomy around the structures and I think in the neonatal period, especially with the piezoelectric devices, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's even technically a little bit easier sometimes. So uh, there's any, you can do it at any age. Um, I did have, the youngest I probably have done was a premature infant that was born at 34 weeks gestation. And, um, or no, maybe it was, maybe it was actually born before 30 weeks of gestation. And then we waited about four to five weeks uh, and then did it, and it was even preterm. So that infant was only really 34 weeks of age at the time that we did the surgery. And for that case, I did have a, a 3D printed model made of the mandible. It was this tiny, tiny little model, but I had the, the company bring me the distractor and I just checked to make sure I could put the device on this little tiny mandible model just to make sure there was enough space to hold it. And there was, and we did it and it was fine. Um, for for uh, an infant at um, age 34 weeks, would you need to watch out for the blood loss and whatnot? And how do you monitor that? Um, so I would say all of those other factors were pretty much the same. The, the blood loss from this procedure is pretty minimal. Um, it can be done, I think, really quite honestly with you know 10 ml of blood loss. It's not, it's not a high blood loss procedure. Okay. And uh, our next question is from Professor Hunta. And the question is, could you tell us a little bit more about the osteotomy technique of the inner table of the mandible and how do we avoid the nerve injury? Mm -hmm. um, so as I was mentioning, some surgeons now, they like to try to make the virtual plan so they can take the inverted L around the, the area of the nerve entry around, you know, around the lingula. But I think, again, it's in many cases, it's not possible. So you, you can mark out the L, okay, but you can expect that in some cases you may still see it. But the way that I do it technically is we make the, the anterior corticotomy first with the piezoelectric saw. We go a little bit more completely at the very bottom border and then at the superior border by the oblique ridge. And then we fix the device in place with the screws. The screws are self-drilling and, and no, you know, we don't use the, the, uh, the, the hand drill, we just, just self-tapping, self-drilling. And then we start opening the distractor a little bit to get a little separation 
and then I reach from underneath the mandible to get the, the back wall, the posterior cortex with the two millimeter osteotome. Uh, and we know where the nerve is running roughly. And so that area, we will try to get all of the rest of the spots around it until you know, saving that portion around the nerve for the last part. part. And just from, from the front and from the back working around it. And you can, you can um, open the bone and leave the nerve still intact. Okay, and our last question is from Dr. Velma, and the question is, what about Cruzon patient with severe apnea at three years old? Would you recommend um, doing the MDO, or would you recommend treating with MARP? And which one would you do first? Also, would you do a transverse or a sagittal plane approach? Uh, yeah, so I mean, this this is a really sort of a different question, right? Because in the Cruzon or Apert patient, it's not a mandibular issue like it is in the Pierre Robin sequence. It's a, you know mid face hypoplasia, so really sort of a different different story. Um, and how I manage those patients, I mean, you know, I I, I think. Uh, many of us have the same struggles say, with those patients. I, I would always prefer that we try to get closer to, uh, you know, say age nine or so before we're doing mid-face distractions. Um, you know, my, some of my colleagues uh, in Brazil, for example, have, have had nice results in showing us that there's they're less, much less likely to repeat doing mid-face distraction if we wait until eight or nine to do it. Um, there are cases where the sleep apnea can be very severe earlier, and and ocular exposure issues. So you know you may have some occasions to consider doing uh, mid-face surgery at a younger age, but you know that because of lack of growth after that, you're going to be almost certainly repeating it. So. I, you know, those cases are very tough, but that's a whole separate question. All right, thank yeah. you. And I guess that's it for Q&A. So back to PY. Yeah, thank you, Juniors. And thank you, Jordan, for your very, very comprehensive talk about the Robin sequence. Uh, I have a, one more little question about the German's devices that is non-invasive and non-surgical, uh, maybe the in instrument to a kind of a remodeling of the oral structure or kind of a device that you know, pushing out the oral, maybe tongue and the lower jaw out day by day. So I'm curious about how much it will affect about the condyle for less devices. Yeah. Yeah. Do you uh, have any, is any ideas? It's a, this is a very good question, and I, I don't think we know. I mean, I, I would have to ask their group if they've done any analyses, because you're right. What, it's, what it is trying to do is promote more forward positioning of the tongue base. Uh, uh -huh. You know, and the idea is that the jaw grows with time, but, um, you know, there's again, there's no surgery involved. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't think that you're going to get um, problems uh, like some people in the early days of mandibular distraction, especially if for those who are going more vertical, they would get, sometimes get problems with TMJ ankylosis after distraction. If you go more, more horizontal, you tend to not have those problems. But with these appliances, I, you know, I don't know. I wouldn't think so, but I don't know what mm -hmm. it, or if they have analyzed what is happening to the shape of the jaw when you use this appliance for a year, because uh, it stays in for, I think, for a long time. Okay. Yeah, I, I think all the results, the outcome, we have to track for a long time, maybe a kind of uh, inferior alveolar nerve injury or any kind of uh, molar teased injury when we apply this kind of device to distal also to, to, to distractions. Okay. Thank you very much again. And uh, I, I would like to invite all our participants today in the daytime or in the evening time to maybe turn on your screaming and to show your beautiful smile uh, to maybe welcome the beautiful day for Dr. Jordan Stanback because in Florida, now I can see it's a very sunshine, a very beautiful day for you. Uh, however, in Asia, we are almost going to sleep now. <laughs> it's always unfair. But anyway, 
Uh, thank you for your coming to this webinar with me and with uh, Jovin. And uh, thank you all our panelists, uh, even you are in Vietnam, in India, and in Taiwan. Dr. Lan, Dr. Nisha, and Dr. Tin Chen. Uh, I can advertise one more time for our next Sunday's the webinar topic. That is the toward evidence-based VPI, rate of pharyngeal insufficiency, the management protocol that will be uh, presented by Egypt's Professor Dr. Ahmed al -Shabrani. Yeah, so seven days ago, see you again. So now, please allow me to count to three and please show me your beautiful smile and then we can take a photo together. Please, one, two, cheese. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One more, one more, yeah. This is the lovely time I always like in ICC. One more time, I will count to three again. One, two, cheese. Very good. Thank you in Philippine Putu and thank you, Taka. Why are you working there? Yeah, you should stay <laughs> in front of a computer. Thank you very much and uh, have a good day and have a good night. And uh, thank you, Professor Jordan Stamberg for your very wonderful yeah. presentation. Yeah, this is a very nice and interesting topic for all of us to learn. Thank you. Thank you, Hideki from Japan. Thank you, IEC. And thank you, Professor Honda. See you next week. Bye bye. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you, Junior. Yep, I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, a tough week again. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Cheers, Cheers, Junior. Bye, bye. Bye. Have a good night. Bye. Thank you, Watanabe. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bolton. Yeah, I, I, we have to invite Bolton to come be our panelist next time. Yeah. Yes. Definitely. Yeah. Bye.